Welcome to STEM Talk. 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 Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegas, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests who appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. So NASA had quite the year in 2022, and it began last February with the Perseverance rover mission and its robotic exploration of Mars. And then in July, the James Webb Space Telescope shared with the world its first absolutely incredible images of the cosmos, which included nebulas and black holes and baby star nurseries. And then in November, we had the successful launch of Artemis One, which is a mission to test NASA's ability to return astronauts to the moon and, and beyond. Our guest today, Dr. Ed Weiler, is a retired NASA scientist who twice led NASA's space science efforts and was instrumental in the genesis of many successful missions. Ed spent nearly 20 years as the chief scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. During his 33-year NASA career, Ed wore many other leadership hats, including Associate Administrator for Science Mission Directorate and Center Director of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, to mention the most significant. So today's interview with Ed is an interesting look at NASA's history and a behind-the-scenes look at the many NASA missions that have been in the news over the past several years. But before we get to our interview with Ed, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews. As always, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing iTunes, Google, Stitcher, and other podcast apps for the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. If you hear you review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the moniker Conser666. The review is titled, STEM Talk is Great. The review reads, Many podcast interviews are full of blather and padding, not STEM Talk. The hosts always have done their homework, and the interviews are informative as well as entertaining. Well, thank you, Conser666, and thanks to all the other STEM Talk listeners who helped STEM Talk become such a great success. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Dr. Ed Weiler. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. I'm your host, Don Carnegie, and joining us today is Ed Weiler. Ed, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. And also joining us is Ken Ford. Hello, Don, and especially hello, Ed. Hi. So, Ed, I understand that we have something in common. So I recently visited the idea of becoming an astronaut and actually went through the selection process to the final round, which is a fascinating experience. And I hear that was also a goal of yours at one point, too. Is that correct? Yeah. Back when I was doing postgraduate work at Princeton, I decided that I'd take a shot. They had advertised for the first time the science astronaut program, not just because before that they always only took uh, you know pilots, but this is the first time they're actually looking for scientists to fly on the space shuttle. Uh, this is back in the 19, let's see, 77 time frame, 78 time frame. And I applied, regretfully. Uh, there were 50,000 other scientists <laughs> who wanted to take this opportunity because it was the first time. I mean, the good news is I made it through several cuts down to maybe 1,000 or something or 500, but they were only picking 20. And so I was finally eliminated at some point. And then I gave up and just be was happy to be an astronomer. Yeah, I was going to say, so instead of becoming an astronaut, you joined NASA in 1978 as a scientist, and you served in a variety of science leadership roles throughout your career. And you retired from NASA in 2011 after a 33-year career, which included two stints as chief of all of NASA space science and almost 20 years as a chief scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. So how do you feel about what you were able to accomplish over those 33 years? <laughs> well, uh well, I, I try I try to uh, limit it to just a few things. I mean, uh, some of the things I'm most proud of is Hubble, of course. Hubble was the story of uh, going up to Mount Everest and then going down to Death Valley during its optical problem. 
and then recovering again and getting back up to the top of Mount Everest when we fixed it. Being part of that whole process, uh, seeing it built, uh, seeing it have a problem, and then most importantly, the vindication of seeing it fixed and helping to make it get fixed was in itself a great accomplishment. But then the 30-some years of absolutely fantastic uh, world-class science has been very heartwarming. I mean, Hubble has become an icon, not just in the United States, in the world. I mean, you can't go on a plane. My experience is that I can be on a plane anywhere in the world. If my seatmate hears I work for NASA, they'll ask me what I work on. I'll say, Hubble. And Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. (laughs) There aren't many programs that any federal agency does that has that kind of staying power. So uh, that was probably the greatest accomplishment. The Mars program, which I helped clean up after the 1998 disasters of two failures. We could talk about that later. But uh, then perhaps the most important one is because of Hubble, I think we've reached tens, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of kids and excited them. Uh, excited them about science, engineering, math. And how do I know that? Because I've actually experienced it by going into schools and talking to kids about uh, science. And I think, uh, you know, if Hubble produced 10 or 20,000 or 100,000 more scientists than would have been produced, then it was well worth the money that was spent on it. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree with that accomplishment and that, that impact. And so 11 years after your retirement, you must have enjoyed the incredible successes that NASA achieved even this past year. So we had the Perseverance mission that was back in February of 2022. And then in July, we had our first images sent back from the James Webb Space Telescope. And then last month, we had the launch of Artemis 1, which is the first in a series of missions that will return humans to the moon and then eventually lead to a manned mission to Mars. So I'm just guessing that you have a a fairly great deal of pride in NASA's continued success and how your earlier work led to where we are today. Yeah, well, I'm especially proud of uh, the Mars program because, as I said earlier, when I first became the head of science at all of NASA in 1998, uh, that was just a few months before two Mars missions were launched and got to Mars, and both were miserable failures, uh, the so-called Mars 98 failures. And I'll never forget my boss at the time was the administrator of NASA. I was the associate administrator. And he calls me up at my son's basketball practice. It was a winter night in, you know, in Annapolis, Maryland. I was freezing out in the parking lot. Anyway, he said, uh, Ed, we've had two failures. I want you to come in. You've got 24 hours to tell me how you're going to fix it. <laughs> and I've been, I was yeah. in the job for like two or three months at that point. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I thought about it a lot. And then uh, I came in the next day and I went to see Dan and I said, Dan, I'm going to propose a, a fix. And he said, what do you want? What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to cancel the entire Mars program and start from scratch. And he said, I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> that sounds just and, like him. <laughs> And that's, and that's what we did. And that's what we did because he was the author and he admitted he made a mistake of the so-called faster, better, cheaper era of NASA. That is, you're going to do it faster, you're going to do it better, you're going to do it cheaper. Anybody who's a practical engineer or scientist knows you can probably do two of those right. things, but not three. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it turned out that Mars missions both failed because they were done on the quick uh, and done cheaply and uh, the proper checking wasn't done. Anyway, we we restructured the Mars program, worked with the science community, came up with a five or six mission program. It turns out that every single one of those missions has now been successful, and we've even had two or three missions following on, including Perseverance was the last mission. And of course, Perseverance has uh, just been a tremendous success so far. I remember those days. I was at NASA Ames in 1998. (laughs) I remember those days well, Ed, and uh, we used to say when he said faster, better, cheaper, you know, noble goals, but we used to always chuckle and say, pick two. Exactly. You know, and, and, that's how, and that's how we fix the Mars program. We still try to do them a little faster and a little better, but if they cost more, that was okay. It was okay to do more testing if only we had done that in the two Mars missions. Absolutely. The photos from the James Webb Space Telescope that were released in July really captured people's imaginations, just as the images from Hubble did back in 94 and ever since, frankly. Can you take a moment and discuss these new images from the James Webb Space Telescope and uh, discuss a little bit what they portray? Yeah, I think the most important one, uh, for me at least, was also the most important one from Hubble. Some, a lot of people remember the so-called Hubble deep field image where Hubble was pointed at one portion of the sky and opened its uh, shutters basically for 24-hour exposure, which pushed Hubble be- well beyond anybody's limits in terms of what they thought Hubble could do. And we saw galaxies, uh, we were looking at one two hundred millionth of the sky, and in that one two hundred millionth, we saw 5,000 galaxies. 
which later we can talk about what that implies for life in the universe. <laughs> but uh, these were galaxies that were literally, you know, only 800, 900 million years old after the Big Bang. And it was just an incredible photograph. I, I used to give talks and talk about that one image for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Well, James Webb now has gone even deeper, which was why it was launched, basically. It was really launched to do what Hubble couldn't do, and that is go deeper to the very, very beginning of when the first stars turned on. Now, we haven't gotten there yet because we, we're still taking test photographs and the first images, but the one that was released recently, I I'm, I'm, uh, uh, remember, I just was looking at it the other day, saw galaxies that were maybe 300, 350 million light, uh, years after, born after the uh, Big Bang. And th this is, you know, <laughs> this is so incredible for so many reasons. When, when I went to graduate school, which was, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth about 50 <laughs> years ago, uh, you know, it was well known, quote unquote, the science community knew that the uh, galaxies and stars, they would take, you know, at least one or two billion years to form after the Big Bang, because after the Big Bang, you know, everything was amorphous hydrogen atoms and you know, how did, how did we go from a, an amorphous cloud of hydrogen atoms into beautifully formed stars and galaxies? It had to take a billion or two billion years. The best theoreticians on Earth, you know, said that, so it must be true, right? Well, Hubble's first deep field images showed what so, so often happens in science, thank God, and that is the universe didn't read our textbooks. It has its own textbook, <laughs> and it did what it wanted to do, and it started forming galaxies much earlier, and as early as maybe eight or 900 million years after the Big Bang, according to Hubble. Well, then James Webb comes along now, and now we can see even farther, and it even deepens the mystery further. The universe actually got its act together well before 300 million years after the Big Bang. And nobody's got a good theory for that. I mean, you go from an amorphous cloud of hydrogen to beautifully formed galaxies that quickly, it just doesn't, doesn't fit our current theories of how things work. So that's going to keep scientists busy for a long, long time. So I think uh, James Webb, again, we're just taking test photographs now and the first real images, but already it's showing its capability. We think it could probably get back to maybe 100 million years when, by, you know, it better not be earlier than that because that's really, <laughs> but we, we think that we'll see the first stars that ever formed about 100 million years after the Big Bang. And James Webb was built to make that happen. Really fascinating stuff. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And we're going to talk more about Hubble and the James Webb Telescope a little bit later in the interview. But first, I'd, I'd like to back up and talk about how you first became interested in space science. And we talked about your interest in becoming an astronaut and applying for that position. But I understand that when you were 13 years old, you decided that you were going to become an astronomer and go to work for NASA someday. So what led you to make up your mind so early about going to work for NASA? Well, and I don't know what, you know, I, I guess it was my dad and mom bought me a little book called The Stars. Uh, it was a real cheap little paperback, probably cost 25 cents back in those days. It was actually, by the way, the book that Mike Griffin, former uh, administrator of NASA and one of your interviewees in the past, got interested in science <laughs> over. Uh, we, cool. had, we shared that one thing in common. We were shocked. Uh, anyway, this little book, it could have been more than 50 or 100 pages long. when it talked about stars and galaxies and all that. And th this is back in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, I read that book. I got interested. And then, then uh, somehow I found out about a lecture being given. Uh, at Northwestern University, which was a long, long, long bus ride and subway ride from uh, where I lived in the south side of Chicago. But anyway, I decided to go to it. It was going to be given by a guy named Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who you may or may not know was the uh, scientist, astronomer who ran Project Blue Book that wanted to do a scientific investigations of UFOs back in the, uh, those early times. One of the things he also did was wrote the book Encounters of the Third Kind, which became a movie, which he actually appeared in. But that's another story for another day. Anyway, so I went to this lecture by Alan Hynek up at Northwestern, and it was in the Dearborn Observatory. Their old telescope was in that building. Uh, and he gave a lecture about UFOs and astronomy. And, uh, you know, it, it just somehow inspired me. And I went home and I decided I wanted to build a bigger telescope. So I got a book on building telescopes and I built a 100 pound, six inch reflector ground the mirror in the Adler Planetarium uh, <laughs> workshop. <laughs> and uh, that all came together. And I basically got so excited about science and astronomy, looking at Jupiter and Saturn and the moon, that I decided that I wanted to go to Northwestern University. I wanted to be an astronomer and I wanted to work for NASA someday. 
because I was also at that time seeing the first pictures coming back from uh, Pioneer and Mariner of the Planets and watching John Glenn and Alan Shepard go up. <laughs> I'd get up early in the morning before grade school and watch the uh, astronauts fly in those little little ships. So I was truly inspired by that. And luckily, there weren't iPhones and the internet. And, uh, you know, I, I had time to do these kind of things. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and that, that, that was a blessing in many ways. <laughs> many, many ways. We, we had three television stations in Chicago. <laughs> oh, oh, we're at so today. <laughs> you mentioned the observatory at Northwestern. Is it still there? Well, Dearborn is. That's the old one where there's an Elvin Clark 18-inch refractor, which was not much of a research tool in today's modern days, but they built a 40-inch research telescope there in the 70s, and I got to use that, and that's what I uh, used for my thesis, my PhD thesis. Regretfully, the, the university decided they want more soccer or football fields, and they tore out, tore down this beautiful structure, which was a real landmark, uh, about five or ten years ago. And uh, I've been very mad at my own university ever <laughs> since then. <laughs> so we've had several guests on STEM Talk who have talked about watching the Apollo missions and the moon landing when they were kids and how that inspired their interest in science and space. You were already in grad school at Northwestern, however, when Neil Armstrong stepped out of his Apollo capsule onto the lunar surface. And I understand that you watched the moon landing on a beach behind the Northwestern campus. Can you tell us about that experience? <laughs> well, actually, uh, as I said, I was still living in, in inner city south side of Chicago. So luckily, Northwestern University, among other things, uh, being a great university, it has its own two private beaches on, Nor on Lake Michigan, which is a very clean lake. And, you know, it's yeah. a, 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 unlike some other, other great lakes. Anyway, I used to go up to the uh, beach on weekends uh, just to, you know, be in the university atmosphere and get away from inner city Chicago in the smog. Anyway, uh, when the Apollo uh, 11 landed, I was actually on the beach listening to the radio. They didn't uh, walk on the moon at that point. They walked on the moon later that day or the day after. I was at home watching it on TV. That's really cool. Just as an aside, um, my dad actually grew up in um, Harvey, Illinois, so south side, south side Chicago. <laughs> so, right, um, that's, that's really south side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just as an aside, I'm familiar with the area. So Ed, you were chief scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope, as we discussed earlier. And even during those days of early development, all the way through the servicing missions that restored the observatory to its tremendous productivity. Was it a, a challenge over that long period of time? And I imagine it had to be in the beginning when there were optical issues to be the advocate and the voice of the science community with respect to Hubble during this long period, but particularly during the critical period. Yeah, well, I, th I think to put it in context, before Hubble, I had uh, never done an interview, never been on TV. In fact, I was f frightened, deathly afraid of public speaking. I uh, remember my first speech class in uh, my uh, high school prep school. It also turned out to be my only absence all four years of high school because I played sick. I didn't want to give my first speech. <laughs> So, uh, and what happened later in my career, of course, is ironic. We launched Hubble, and to much hoopla, I mean, NASA had never experienced so much interest other than at the moon landing. I mean, Cape Canaveral, Cape Canaveral just flooded with reporters. There were circus tents to hold all the reporters. And I was doing interviews, you know, I had microphones in my face for three or four days prior to launch uh, constantly. I did the Today Show with Brian Gumbel, you know, live. And I this here's a guy who was afraid to go to speech class, you know. Uh, but but they, they taught me something. Before we went down for the launch, I'll, this is a funny story. Uh, we had a quote-unquote quote, quote, media training. They brought in professional people uh, like ex-anchors to tell us what to watch out for from the, some of these people who can be slime ball sometimes. Uh, anyway, I remember one thing they said, if they, if you get a asked a question that uh, is really tacky or nasty, uh, the best thing to do is just say one word answer, yes or no, and then give them dead air. They cannot stand dead air on live television. <laughs> So anyway, Brian Gumbel uh, had sent me down a whole bunch of questions uh, before the interview, and then, uh, you know, he stuck to it more or less, but then he threw in a zinger, like uh, I think it was, the question was, Dr. Weiler, isn't it true that the space shuttle program was totally justified by NASA to launch a space telescope? And uh, I knew this was a, a zinger, so I, I hesitated, and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> 1001, 1002, and he went on to the next question. <laughs> 
Anyway, so I came back. I came back from uh, the Cape in high hopes we were on top of Mount Everest. I mean, everybody loved Hubble. I mean, you know, it was going to solve all these problems, and everybody loved it. And then about two months later, we finally had to admit we had a serious optical problem that could not be easily fixed. And it just, I mean, the media went crazy. I mean, there were jokes, uh, you know, published in papers. I mean, you know, Hubble became a national disgrace. I remember, I'll never forget the cartoon of a picture of Mr. Magoo and underneath it, it said yeah. the true inventor of the Hubble Space Telescope. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and remind me later if I forget to tell you the, the, the ultimate joke comic that uh, vindicated that. Anyway. So I remember pushing my one-year-old son around the neighborhood in a, uh, in a stroller with my four-year-old daughter in my hand, and I'd have neighbors come up to me in Annapolis and say, oh, it must be so difficult working, working on a national disgrace. You know, so this is the kind of attitudes I was running into. And I think everybody on the Hubble team was getting the same kind of stuff thrown at them. I won't use the word, <laughs> the S word, but it was not a good time. Uh, but that brought us together. I mean, that in itself was a good thing because it formed what I think my, in my life, the, the most cohesive team I've ever been associated with. We had people from the NASA centers, uh, Goddard Ames, JPL, NASA headquarters, the contractors, the universities working to fix this thing. And uh, it was like a badgeless team. I mean, everybody had one goal in mind, vindication. We knew we could fix it. Luckily, we had started building a backup camera, you know, several years earlier, the so-called Widefield Camera 2 or the clone, if you will. And that was going to supply 80, 90% of the kind of data that the public really wanted to see. And we knew we could do it. It was going to be pretty hard. It would be take five EVAs, uh, extra vehicle uh, activity, when the astronauts go out, of eight hours each, six to eight hours each. Never been done, never been done by the astronauts, that many EVAs. But we, we knew we could do it. And we worked on it and worked on it. Slowly, the uh, media lost entrance. They had basically declared us dead, so we just kept working on the mission. And then uh, December, December uh, 1993 came along, and uh, we launched, I believe, on December 2nd or December 1st. Well, forget the night, but it was cl close to midnight. Anyway, it was a night launch. It was absolutely incredible from the Cape. And just, just after the shuttle went up, it was still dark. And interestingly enough, we saw Hubble following the shuttle, uh, a bright dot in the sky moving from uh, west to east, just behind the, behind the shuttle going up. It was a real uh, awe-inspiring sight. So uh, the mission went on. I remember going to Johnson Space Center for operations. And uh, the only way I could describe the next seven days, the EVA started two days after we got there to Hubble, was it was like a dream. Because the first EVA occurred, we had a few problems, but they were solved. The second EVA occurred, everything went well. Third EVA occurred, everything went well. Fourth EVA occurred, 550. It was like being in a dream sequence. I, we, none of us could believe we would have been happy before launch if we had fixed maybe 50% of the problems. Because we had other problems, solar panels, the gyros, you know. There was a whole bunch of early problems with Hubble. And then the mission was over and we went home and we knew we knew we had just gone through major eye surgery, but the bandages were still on. <laughs> we, we wouldn't take them off for several weeks. So we went home feeling really, really good about accomplishing, thinking we accomplished the impossible. And then uh, December 20th came, uh, about two weeks later. We, we didn't promise the media that we'd have uh, data until about early January, but uh, things kept going really, really well. And uh, I remember getting a, we, we wore pagers back in those days. Thank God we didn't have iPhones. So the, my pager went off and it was uh, my, my buddies up at the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore where the data comes down that said, hey, Ed, we've got news. We got the first, we're going to get the first picture from the wide field camera tonight, you know, near midnight. So rushed up there to Baltimore from Annapolis and then a whole bunch of astronomers were around the <laughs> I think everybody in the United States has seen this this uh, video once or twice in their lives because it's been played time and time again. But it's a video of a whole bunch of astronomers looking at a computer screen, and suddenly a whole a star field appears. And we knew right away we had fixed it because the stars weren't blurry, uh, they weren't fuzzy, they were crystal clear. And everybody just went crazy. I mean, it was the ultimate moment of vindication. I mean, I still get a tear in my eye when I think yeah. of that moment. <laughs> And the rest is history. Uh, you know, 1994 uh, followed it. Uh, you know, we had, I think, eight or nine major press releases of Hubble data. Every single one made the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post, among other places. The Eagle Nebula came out, which made the front page, I think, of every paper in the world. 
and the rest is history. The telescope has been the most successful scientific instrument ever built by humans. I think that's not an overstatement. And it's got name recognition across the world. I remember the uh, final servicing mission, standing on the porch there, looking out at two shuttles on the pad at the same time. Oh, and yeah, that was neat. Yeah, it I remember was that neat. too, Ken. Right, and thinking, you know, this is an amazing thing to see, and it reflects well in our culture and our society and the willingness to do such things, not for conquest or for gold, but to know something. and uh, or, or, or for politics. Yeah, I mean, it, the world was so different then. <laughs> it, it was a, a pretty wonderful day. You remember that, right? Looking out, oh, and, yes. and there uh, they are, sitting there ready to go. And uh, it was a powerful moment for me. Well, Ed, let's back up again and talk about what you did after graduating from Northwestern in 1976. So you spent the next two years on the research staff at Princeton while working at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And then in 1978, you became a staff scientist at NASA headquarters. How did that position come about? Right. Well, it was actually three years at Princeton because I joined Princeton in 1976, February, and I was at Princeton until like October or so of uh, 78. But the interesting thing about that was that my boss at Princeton happened to be this astronomer named Lyman Spitzer, who, uh, if you know Hubble history, is now given full credit for being the father of the Hubble Space Telescope. He, he uh, wrote a paper about telescopes in space in uh, the late 40s when he was working for the RAND Corporation. Uh, during the World War II, astronomers, scientists were sort of drafted into the military not to fight with, as soldiers, but to you know, work on technology. In fact, Dr. Spitzer worked on the, uh, the, uh, the bomb site. I forget what it was called. Uh, the Norden bomb site. <laughs> Norden bomb site. That's the one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, when you get my age, you forget these things. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so he, he, and then he came back and, uh, you know, to Princeton and he wrote some papers. He saw what the V2 missiles could do uh, in terms of their power to go up, not just come down, so to speak. And he said, you know, if we could develop a, a rocket that could put something in orbit, putting a telescope in orbit would really be neat because you'd be above the messy atmosphere we have and you'd see stars like they were meant to see. Plus, you'd see 95 <laughs> percent of the rest of the radiation coming from stars because most of the interesting radiation like X-ray, gamma ray, ultraviolet, infrared is blocked by the atmosphere. Which, by the way, is a good thing. Yeah, I'm really happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> if if X-rays and ultraviolet got down, we wouldn't be talking today. Uh, Anyway, so uh, he was my boss at Princeton, and little did I know that that would lead to uh, people at NASA, because they talked to Lyman all the time, uh, hearing about me. And, uh, you know, there was an opening at NASA in uh, late 78, and Dr. Nancy Roman, who was the chief of astronomy at that time and the chief scientist on Hubble, and by the way, not only was she the first female chief of astronomy and the only chief of astronomy up to that point. Uh, anyway, she came down to my little itsy bitsy office at Goddard. I spent about three weeks a month at Goddard and one week uh, a month out doing research up at Princeton. And she came down and said, would you like to come and be a staff scientist at uh, NASA headquarters and assist me on Hubble and other projects? And uh, I, I was unmarried at the time and working on a contract, basically, so not sure of how long I'd have a job at Princeton. And she was offering me a civil service science position, and that looked pretty good. So I said, yeah, why not? So I, I took it. And at that time, I realized that I'd be giving up my research career. But as she helped me basically justify it, she said, yeah, you won't be able to do research in, in Washington, not a good environment. But you will be uh, not only do research yourself, but enabling thousands of other scientists to do research. And hopefully that would satisfy, <laughs> satisfy you. And I said, yeah, I guess it would. Is it better for me to write a few science papers or enable other scientists to write thousands of science papers? So I took the job, and as interestingly happened, for some reason, I'm, I take jobs and suddenly my boss leaves in one year. When I went to Princeton, <laughs> my, boss at, uh, uh, my, my boss at Goddard, uh, who was my secondary boss, Lyman was my overall boss, but Walt Upson, he retired. <laughs> and so I got the job as the head of the group at Goddard. And then Nancy Roman brings me to headquarters, and she retires a year after I get to headquarters. So I become chief scientist for Hubble and chief of astronomy. I, I like to mention this because I know so many people today worry about their resume and keeping up their resume and, you know, getting their next job. I will admit I had never, I have never in my career thought about what I would be doing in three years or five years or 10 years. I wasn't, I wasn't worried in moving up. I was just worried about, and this is absolute truth, doing as well as I could in what I was doing. 
And so I, I never had, wrote a never had resume. And yet over the years, I went from chief of astronomy to chief of the origins program to director of astrophysics to associate administrator, center director of Goddard. I never asked for any of those positions. Mm. People just came to me and said, would you like to do this? Well, maybe that and was said, because you were focused on doing a good job at what you were doing well, currently. That's, the, that's what I try to get. I, I do some leader. I still do. I did a lot of leadership courses when I was at NASA and I'm still asked to do them now. And that's the thing I like to point out. To, and in this generation, the last few generations, you know, the, the kind of shock to them that I <laughs> never did a resume, for instance, and that I didn't have a five or 10 year plan. And maybe that's bad. I don't know, but it kind of worked for me. So, Ed, you were also the director of the Astronomical Search for Origins program. Can you tell us about that program? Right. The uh, the new associate administrator, whose job I was eventually going to get, uh, was Wes Huntress, and he decided he didn't like the management structure of having an astrophysics division and a planetary division and a solar division. So he created a board of directors, okay, of science areas like high energy astrophysics, uh, planetary science, and my area was Astronomical Search for Origins which uh, basically covered Hubble and uh, JWST and basically optical, visible, and infrared astronomy, uh, space infrared telescope facility. Our science area was understanding the beginning of the universe and how we got here, basically. That, that was, didn't last too long. That was only about a two-year period. But I kind of developed some ideas uh, during that period of time, you know, working on JWST, trying to get JWST started and get servicing missions for Hubble done. And that is, uh, you know origins. It kind of got to me. And little did I realize it, but two years later when I was going to become the associate administrator of all of science, it led me to realize that you know, everything we do in science at NASA really comes down to some basic questions and kind of origins is a major part of that. And I remember that uh, when I finally gave up that job of uh, origins director and became the uh, AA, the very first day I sat down with my senior people in uh, the science organization, about, you know, there are 150 people then, but maybe about 10 senior people. And I said, you know, we pr the, the organization produces these strategic plans, which are 80 pages long and full of science and pretty pictures and missions. And, you know, we try to use these to justify our program to Congress and sell it to the people, American people and all that. But I said, you know, it should be easier than that. We should be able to explain to our benefactors in an elevator speech, you know, in a, in a minute, what we're all about. And I really want you to focus on the following. We really are about four basic questions. And they're not science questions. They're, they're kind of human nature questions. How did the universe begin? How did we get here? Where are we going? And perhaps the most fundamental question of all, are we alone? And this worked. People got into it. And to this day, the are we alone <laughs> is still a major, probably more part of NASA now than it's ever been. And uh, it really caught on. It led to things like Kepler, the search for planets, and, you know, the JWST, we want to study exosolar planets, so their atmospheres. And it is, it's a human question. I mean, I maintain uh, the first time that Fred and Wilma Flintstone looked out the sky, Wilma said, what's that light up there? And Fred said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, Fred probably uh, made something up. Yeah, right. It's, it's Barney's porch light. I don't know. Yeah. That's the trouble with being in our generation. We remember such things. Yeah, and it when you say it uh, these days, half the people in the room just look blankly at you. They uh, they don't understand <laughs> the reference whatsoever. I know it's That's it's well. It's, <laughs> again, we we lived in a non-internet, non-iPhone day. Right. As you mentioned earlier, in 1998, you became the associate administrator for space science for the first time. I understand that when you were first approached about the job, you said something like, not in a million years, uh, <laughs> but you changed your mind. Uh, could you yeah, well, tell me a little bit about that? Can, can you remember Dan Golden? Oh, uh, yes. He uh, fired me twice. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, and then you that, had, that's an honor. <laughs> you know, do you remember the, there was a general that uh, was always with him? And the, the, I can't remember the guy's name. Oh, uh, not Armstrong uh, no, General. You, I know you, who you, you mean. You know who I mean. Big, right? tall, big tall, thin guy. He, exactly. And he was, oh, um, he, he's not serious. Not to worry. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I know. I went to him for counseling many times, too. <laughs> Uh, remind me to tell you a story before we, you know, finish today about, uh, I finally actually cornered Dan, Dan and asked him why he always treated me well. And I'll tell you that later on. 
Okay, so Wes Huntress, who was the creator of the uh, you know Origins program and the board of directors and all that, he was not on Dan's list of favorite people, and he finally got fed up and finally decided to leave. And uh, he recommended me to Dan to, to replace him. And Dan came to me, and I said, no, I'm quite happy working on Origins and Hubble and things like that, and I'd re- rather not do this. And, you know, I don't know if I said not to him in a million years to him, because he would have probably fired me if I said yeah. that. Yeah, he, he wasn't I, I that kind of guy. <laughs> I, I, yeah, you didn't joke around like that. But I did ter- turn it down and said, uh, I'll certainly be happy to act in that position until you get somebody to replace me. Two months went by, and I saw the kind of candidates he was looking at and interviewing. And after about two months of this, I I I remember calling him up, and he was on his uh, he was on his private jet. So uh, in in those days, the good old days, NASA had his own private jet, and he was flying to L.A. or something for a JPL meeting. Anyway, I called him up on the jet, and I said, Dan. Uh, I kind of come to a decision. So what do you mean? I said, you know, I've seen some of the people you've been interviewing. And frankly, I don't want to spend a big, big chunk of my career training them to do, do what I could do and, you know, without even thinking. Uh, I'll be I'll be willing to take the job. He said, OK, you got it. And that yeah. was it. See, Dan is a smart guy. I, he probably just interviewed those people to motivate you to take the job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll never know. But uh, I, I do I do remember uh, and I'm I'm jumping way forward, but I don't want to forget it. Just before he was going to leave NASA, and we had a great relationship, I couldn't figure out why, because so many people had a poor relationship with him. And I I cornered him. I said, Dan, you know, you're leaving now, so I can can ask this question. Why is it we got along so well and and you never really, you know, you always treated me with respect and, you know, ta-da-ta-da-ta. He said, well, you probably don't realize this, Ed, but you're one of the few people I've run into at NASA who was capable of telling me no. He said, I hate yes men. And I was surrounded by yes men for many, many years. And the, the one thing I remember him when we almost came to blows, but then he really thanked me for it was when uh, it was some kind of crazy idea. Oh, it was sending airplanes to Mars or something. Yeah. yeah. It was a Mars airplane program. I remember that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a great idea and all that, but it, it was under budgeted. It was way too, you know, as it turned out, of course, we're now flying helicopters, but, you know, that's 30 years later. <laughs> But I said, you know, and I was in charge of the Mars program. I said, Dan, I know it's a great idea. And I know you, he loved it right away. He wanted to do it. I I said, you know, it's just, we've got so much on our plate. We just lost two Mars missions. We're just putting together a new program. Even though this sounds like a great, sexy idea and Congress would love it. uh, You know, we just don't have the right budget for it. And we, and there's not enough time in the schedule for it. And he basically almost threw me out of his office. But about two or three or four weeks passed by, some more data came in, some more people told him the same thing. And, uh, you know, basically a month or two later, the program was not, was decided not to be put forward. And uh, little did I know that that's a thing that really made an impact on him with me. So during your first stint as associate administrator, you oversaw a number of successful missions and, and you also set in motion an ambitious program to explore Mars during your time as associate administrator. So can you talk to our listeners about how this led to the Mars Odyssey and also the Mars Exploration Rover missions? Again, uh, I think I already told a story about after the two Mars failures, Dan called me up and uh, told me to 24 hours fix the problem. So overnight, I decided there's only one way to fix a problem cancel faster, better, cheaper, which got us into the mess of Mars 98 and the two failures. So from that point forward, of course, it's a long story. I'll try to make it short, but we formed a team of scientists, outside scientists from universities. We got Scott Hubbard from Ames to come in and basically lead the program. He only stayed a year, but he did a great job leading the program, getting the scientists to come up with a series of missions and a plan. Again, not the faster, better, cheaper way of doing things, but uh, a little more money and a little more care. And so they took about a year and developed the program. They decided to keep Mars Odyssey, which was already in the program, but do a lot more testing and be absolutely sure that we uh, had it right this time. And also listen to people. One of the problems with one of our missions, I think it was Mars MCO, got off course because basically the navigator saw a problem, a small problem. The uh, data was always like about one sigma in the wrong direction. And people just didn't pay much attention because there's only one sigma. The trouble is the data was always one sigma every time they measured it. And these errors built up and built up and built up. And instead of coming into Mars about three, 400 miles above Mars surface, it came in about 20 miles above Mars surface, which was basically in the atmosphere and it burned up. 
So uh, this is the kind of stuff that happens when you're in a rush and don't take care. You don't, you don't listen to the right people. Anyway, so Scott and the uh, scientists came up with a program starting with Mars Odyssey and uh, then a, a rover. But going back to the idea of not trying to land like Mars Polar Lander on legs, but going back to the idea of landing on airbags, which we had done successfully earlier with Pathfinder. And then uh, ultimately leading to a, uh, a lander with a nuclear power source, which wound up being Curiosity. So then that got, plan got put in place. And as we were developing it, Dan uh, had an idea. He called us up into his office, Scott and me and uh, one other person. So there were only four people in the room. And he said, I like your plan about the Mars rover on uh, airbags, but I got a proposal for you. And we said, what do you mean? He said, you know, crashing things into Mars does not get good press and it's not good for our funding with Congress and it's just not good in general. Why don't we try to ensure success by doing two rovers at the same time, build a copy and launch them to different spots? Uh, <laughs> we looked at each other like, wait a minute, somebody's actually telling us to do more missions. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I, I forget who talked first, but we said, well, we'll have to call Charles Alachi at JPL, the director, and, and ask him. But, uh, you know, Dan, there's only, it's only two or two and a half years to launch. I mean, you know, we're asking them to start building a copy. He said, well, figure it out. So we call up Charles and Charles, uh, after his heart attack, got up off the floor <laughs> yeah, and said, well, we will try, but there's no guarantees. Make a long story short, we wound up launching two rovers to Mars, Spirit and Opportunity, and Dan, Dan Golden deserves all the credit for that. He was an aggressive guy, and uh, they both succeeded, wildly succeeded. It lasted much longer than the six months we promised. And, of course, the rest is history. Curiosity was launched with his brand-new launching system and Skycrane, and it worked beautifully, and several other Mars missions leading up to Perseverance. And uh, we basically had eight or nine Mars missions in a row now, knock on wood, that uh, have been total successes. Yeah, so that's a long way from <clears throat> Mars 98. It's been a great run, and uh, I remember Mars 98 clearly, and the hit the morale took across the whole agency was, was serious. Oh, yeah. I, I remember there's one little personal story there, which I know Charles really appreciated. He asked me to come out after the Mars 98 disaster because his people were being hired like crazy by Silicon Valley, being offered twice the third, three times the salary that Caltech could pay him, and signing bo bonuses of Mercedes, you know. It was just really bad morale at JPL. And this is as we're starting to build up the new program. And I remember... Uh, you know, it was an acapella speech. I mean, he called me up. I went out there and I didn't really do much thinking what I'd say other than just try to boost their spirits. But I remember one point, you know, again, with the origins theme in mind, I said, you know, I know you guys are uh, and gals are being approached by Silicon Valley, offered a lot more money, uh, a lot more perks. But you have to ask yourself a question. 20, 30 years from now, when your granddaughter ask you, uh, daddy or granddaddy or grandmommy, what did you do when you worked uh, at NASA? Uh, or what did you do earlier in life? And you, you have two options. You could say, well, I worked at Silicon Valley and I am on the proud, I, I did something incredible in Silicon Valley. I invented a cell phone that was a half ounce less weight than the previous cell phone. Or you can tell them, I worked on a mission that for the first time in human history discovered life on another planet. What would you like to tell your kid? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I use a similar story when uh, we were being poached. Uh, and uh, I say, you know, you could become a celebrity in Silicon Valley by inventing the like button. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or you could do something meaningful. <laughs> right. And something that will be remembered a lot longer <laughs> than an iPhone. And influence a lot more people in a much better way. <laughs> in a positive way. Well, the way, way. I like to point way. it. I mean, in a positive way. Only once in human history. Only once, and how many things can you say about it? Only once will we be able to say we are not alone. I would so much like to be alive when that happens. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience.
So, Ed, our listeners also might be interested in the role that you played in the development of the New Horizons craft and its mission to fly by and study Pluto and its moons. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's another kind of example of my leadership style. I tend to be like a bull in a china shop. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are many Pluto missions. JPL proposed many Pluto. Ken will probably remember this too. Uh, many Pluto missions in the 90s and uh, 2000s. And, you know, they were all pretty aggressive. They all wound up costing or would have cost billions of dollars like a typical <laughs> mission in those days. And I just kept canceling one after the other because we couldn't afford that kind of money uh, in those days. And finally, I came up with the idea, which a lot of people liked. I said, well, maybe the problem is there's no competition at JPL. <laughs> why, why don't we go competitive with uh, a Pluto mission? Put it out to bid in the universities. Sure enough, instead of a billion uh, dollars, uh, Alan Stern and uh, Southwest Research Corporation and APL, uh, Applied Physics Lab and Johns Hopkins, came in with a proposal uh, to do a Pluto mission flyby, which uh, was in the uh, you know, 500, 600, 400, $100 million dollar range, which was frankly a lot cheaper than what we were getting from JPL. We selected it and, you know, the rest is history. It was a fantastic mission. I mean, who would have thought what they found? I remember the consternation that that generated at JPL and some other circles. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's it's tough. I under, understand the prime. And don't get me wrong. I love JPL. I mean, oh, they, yeah, they me gave too. me the Mars pro. They gave me the Mars program, you know, uh, and I was a center director. So I love centers, obviously. But, uh, you know, you get you get frustrated because because, you know, there's got to be a cheaper way to do this. And that's, of course, the whole problem was what drove Dan to the, the faster, better, cheaper. He came into an agency where every damn mission was costing a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And some of these things, as we well know, spirit and opportunity were a few hundred million each. I mean, we could do good things for less money. Absolutely. When your time as the associate administrator for the science mission directorate ended in 2004, as you mentioned earlier, you took over leadership at Goddard Space Flight Center, and that's a great place. Could you talk about the work the center does and did then and your role as the director? Yeah, well, I, I took over Goddard, uh, you know, in uh, oh about August of '04. Yeah, and uh, one of the first things I noticed, and uh, I had been used to being a leader. I mean, I was a leader of 150 people at NASA headquarters, but now I was stepping into uh, what I like to call the village. <laughs> it was, and you know this from working at Ames. I mean, there are 10,000 people who call Goddard their home. <laughs> you know, about uh, 3,000 civil servants and about 7,000 contractors who walk into the door every day. And the center director is like the mayor of that village. Uh, you, you don't worry, worry just about science or hardware or engineering or science. You have to worry about roads and commodes and you know, <laughs> landscaping. And uh, this was quite a challenge. Uh, we had feral cats. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I, this is another thing I also uh, like to tell leadership courses when they ask what I did as a leader. And I usually say nothing. I said, what do you mean nothing? I said, well, not quite nothing. But the first thing I did as a leader was find all the right people, the best people I could to do all the jobs I didn't want to do on a daily basis and then throw them out of the nest and let them fly. And that's what I do with the kind of things I didn't want to worry about at Goddard, like like the potholes and landscaping and building maintenance and that kind of stuff. And I, I try to concentrate on engineering and science. One of the first things I learned, because before I became center director, I made a surreptitious visit to Goddard. I just drove into Goddard and walked around into various buildings and walked into people's offices and said, Hi, I'm Ed. I'm going to be your center director in a few weeks. Uh, tell me what's, what's right and what's wrong about this place. And that was a very interesting experience after, after, again, their heart attack when they got off the floor. <laughs> they got very, very uh, talkative. And one of the things I remember uh, to this day of learning was we're very frustrated as scientists here because our previous center director basically told us we aren't good enough to compete with JPL and we are not allowed to propose planetary missions to uh, Discovery or New Frontiers AOs, which was uh, the way we solicited new missions and planetary by then. And I said, you're kidding. They said, no, we're not allowed to even propose. So uh, long story short, in one of my first uh, speeches to the whole center, I said, and as of this moment, I'm setting a new policy. The preclusion of proposing is not only removed, we, I encourage you to compete with the rest of the world because the scientists here are as, are as good as any place else. Long story short, they started competing and they won New Frontiers missions. They won Discovery missions. OSIRIS-REx was a Goddard mission. A lunar Orbiter was a you know, Goddard mission. So Goddard, uh, you know, did very well. 
I'm kind of proud of that because I couldn't believe that people wouldn't even be allowed to compete. Other things at Goddard, uh, <laughs> this is just a, a random thing. I, lasers were out of control. Earth science uses lasers a lot to do sounding, uh, you know, measure the level of ice in Greenland and things like that with ice set. Anyway, there are like seven or eight independent laser groups at Goddard competing for funds. And I got, whis- it got whispered in my ear, you know, none of them are really doing much because they have such low funding. So long story short, over about a year, Ken, you'll probably appreciate this too, trying to get rid of labs or close down groups oh at a my. center is next to impossible. But I closed down about five of the seven laser groups and got it down to two and, you know, tripled their funding and they started to make progress. So, uh, you know, li- little things like that. I mean, you know, uh, I-, I went to Goddard and the Hubble ser- last Hubble servicing mission had been canceled by Sean O'Keefe. So we had to deal with that. We were trying to get ready for a robotic servicing mission, but that never really made any sense. But we had to salute and do it. Then, thank God, Sean O'Keefe left and Mike Griffin, thank God, came on board. And long story short, Mike looked at all the things and decided that, hey, we can we can safely launch another shuttle if we have another one on the pad. And the rest is history. We did the final servicing mission and Hubble has lasted. Uh, God, we did that in 2010. Hubble has lasted another 12 years because of that servicing mission. So thank you, Mike Griffin. So speaking of Mike Griffin, he was the NASA administrator in 2008. And as you mentioned, he asked you to return as an associate administrator for the science mission director for the second time. And just as an aside, Mike has been our guest on SEMTALK twice, both episodes 23 and 134. And we'd like to know why were you brought back again and what did he ask you to accomplish? Well, uh, not to get too personal, (laughs) but uh, Sean O'Keefe, not my favorite administrator. After two successful Mars landers, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, my reward was being uh, removed from my job as associate administrator and sent to Goddard as center director. Don't get me wrong, that was one of the best moves I've ever made. But at the time, I was bewildered by it, if you know what I mean, because I was at the peak of my career as associate administrator, and suddenly I'm told you're going to Goddard, which, as again, turned out, it was one of the best experiences of my life. But at the time, it didn't seem like it, because who knew what the future was going to draw? Anyway, for the next three years, I call it musical chairs for associate administrators for science. They had three different, actually four different associate administrators in just a period of three years. Before that, I had been the associate administrator for six and a half years, just for context. To say some of them weren't that successful would be an understatement. The last one kind of got into Mike's hair. He didn't always do what Mike told him to do. Like uh, the thing that really cracked the camel's back was uh, when this person announced to the press without telling Mike that he was going to not fund uh, Mars. It was either Spirit or Opportunity, those beloved little rovers on yeah, Mars. I remember to that. The press. Yeah, that incident. <laughs> Mike came yeah. into work that day and found out. And I got a call that same morning, about an hour later, from Mike's deputy, uh, Chris Scalise, saying, Ed, we want you to come back to headquarters. I said, what are you, out of your mind? I'm, I'm very happy here. He said, the current AA just did something that broke Mike's back. He wants you back here. I said, okay, well, I'll think about it. Uh, you know. So I thought about it all day, and I, I figured I, I just about basically had to do it because I was getting a lot of emails from my former staff saying, Ed, we wish you would come back. We, we really, you know, we've had four AAs in three years, and we just, we're, we're just directionless, you know. So at the end of the day, I said, okay, Chris, I'll do what Mike wants me to do. And uh, basically, the, the reason to come back was to fix the problems to provide leadership again and set the course again. The AA that I was replacing, who basically, uh, quote unquote, left, uh, retired, quote unquote, basically uh, was promising, making all these promises. Oh, we can do this mission. We can do that mission. And I'm going to make them half as expensive. I'm going to make them 20% uh, cheaper. So he was making all these promises. And uh, when I walked in the door, I had this strategic plan that when I started thinking about how much it would really cost, you know, it was billions and billions and billions, to quote Carl Sagan, <laughs> Sagan <laughs> dollars out, out of bed with reality. So what Mike brought me back to do was get back to reality. You know, it'll make a lot of people mad because promises would have to be broken. But frankly, they were ridiculous promises in the first place. For sure. So that's what I did for the last three years was uh, get the program back into shape. At one point, I even went uh, to uh, JWST was out of control at that time. And, you know, now I can say this because I knew the only way to get JWST more money and back under control was to threaten to cancel it. So I went up to I went up to the uh, new administrator, Charlie Bolin, and Chris Scalise, who was still the deputy, and said, guys, the contractor's out of out of control. This is like in 2010 now, about a year before it really blew up and it got all the extra money. 
I said, there's only one thing we can do here. We got to get this control, this contractor under control. They see us as a cash cow and they're going to keep burning billions and billions unless we either give them religion or cancel the program. Well, they didn't decide they wanted, would have a cancellation review, which I recommended. They decided to have a cost review, which is NASA's way of basically making things cost more, in my opinion. <laughs> And uh, this guy Kasani came in, had a commission, uh, you know, study mm -hmm. it. And a year later, they came back and said, oh, what JWST needs is three or four billion dollars more. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, and by the way, the con that wasn't even enough for the contractor. They still burned through that and they even had to get more. So uh, they never really got under control. And regretfully, that'll probably be forgotten because now the JWST is successful. I'm sure the sins of the past will be forgotten, but I'll never forget them. That contractor spent way more money than they should have. Yeah. In my <clears throat> humble opinion. It's good that you did what you could to get it under control, but th those things are tough, you know, that so political. And once you're far into the program like that, it has all this momentum and all these uh, advocates. It's really yeah, hard. Ex ex exactly. I, I remember, actually, uh, I'm a scientist, so I can say this. I actually blame my science community for some of the overruns because when we started GWST, we started with uh, three instruments as recommended by the science community. But after we got started two or three or four years later, some, some scientist in the community said, you know, it would really be great if we put another instrument out there that went really deep into the infrared. And this would require cryogenic cooling. Oh, boy. Uh, long story short, this was over my dead body, basically, as associate administrator. I said, let's be happy with what we got. It's going to cost enough. And you guys didn't recommend this in the first place. And now as an afterthought, you want to put it on. But they, of course, went over my head to Mikulski and uh, Senator Mikulski at the time, and they got the right political clout, and they got the contractor on their side because the same damn contractor was going to build a cryo cooler. Long story short, it got added, and it overran two or three or four times. Mm -hmm. The cryo cooler itself ran, overran three or four hundred percent. So it wasn't just the contractor that uh, overran; it was the science community itself that pushed a little too hard. So they're to blame a little bit. But again, all this stuff will be forgotten. And by the way, just a side note: How many people today know that Hubble overran three hundred percent? <laughs> it was supposed to cost. See, there was silence on the end. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Hubble was supposed to cost four hundred twenty million. Uh, it came in at one point six billion. Mm -hmm. Factor four higher. I remember um, the controversy actually about the overruns for Hubble. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and by the way, it was worth every penny. Of course, and they fade into the sort of myths of time over time uh, <laughs> exactly. if it's successful. But if it's a failure, uh, there's oh boy. no digging out of that. And to be fair, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm making light of this but uh, with the contractors, uh, but, you know, we're not building carburetors for Toyotas, you know. <laughs> we're, we're doing stuff that no other country on earth could do, and we've proven that time and time again. And when you do something for the first time, it's kind of hard to predict how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. When you were at NASA, speaking of technology, I remember there was another priority of yours that you were working on in a collaboration with the Department of Energy. And it was RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Right. And uh, this is what powers curiosity. And uh, uh, I've heard you refer to it as our nuclear rover. Can you talk about RTGs a little and that whole experience? Yeah, well, as a, you know, I'm, I'm trained as an astrophysicist, which means I also have a lot of physics. And uh, I can't tell you how much I go around my neighborhood when people are complaining about the cost of energy and all that. I said, well, if you guys weren't so against nuclear energy, a lot of our problems today would be solved. <laughs> yeah, I'm, Absolutely. A, I'm a very great nuclear energy supporter. And frankly, one of the reasons it's we have some of the lowest uh, power uh, cost uh, in the country here uh, in uh, Florida, like about 11 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour, and people wonder why. It's because we have one of the highest number of nuclear generators <laughs> in the country. But anyway, RTGs are not like nuclear fission. They, are, they basically run off the heat that decaying plutonium gives off. Uh, plutonium, I think, is 238, maybe 237, my, my age is telling here. <laughs> one of those two is uh, one of the isotopes. If you put a bunch of that into a encasement and then uh, put a heat converter into electricity in it, as it produces heat, the heat is turned into electricity, and you've got basically a battery. Except in the case of uh, RTG using plutonium, that battery can last 10, 20, 30 years. In fact, on Voyager, uh, when, God, when was Voyager launched in the 70s? Uh, mm -hmm. They're still last, they've lasted 50 years. So, of course, solar panels don't work very well at the edge of the solar system with Voyager. So, uh, RTGs are really required for either long term use or for uh, use in the outer solar system. 
the DOE decided they weren't going to do RTGs much more because NASA was the only customer. So I negotiated a lot with DOE and we threw in some of our own money. We got Congress involved, which always helps. And they developed some new, new technology RTGs, I think called MMRTGs, which are now being used, which you use a little less plutonium. We even, because plutonium wasn't being made anymore in the United States by DOE, we, before we could start up again in the United States, we had to find a source of plutonium. So we actually negotiated with the Russians. This was in a different world again, not today's world. We negotiated with the Russians back in the uh, 1990s to buy some of their uh, plutonium left over from their decommissioned nuclear weapons. And I always thought it was a great thing to get plutonium out of weapons and put into science. So we did that. You know, long story short is we've got plutonium now and we've got RTG. And they are what make these Mars missions what they are. I mean, Curiosity's still going many, many years uh, later. Uh, well, what is it, 10 years now, I guess? 10 years later? Who knows how long it could last? One of the problems mm-hmm. with solar panels on Mars, there's plenty of sunlight. Dust. The trouble is they have these darn things called dust storms on Mars. And solar panels tend to get covered with dust to the point where you have to stop using the rover. Or it actually winds up killing the rover. I think it's one of the causes of one of the uh, spirit or opportunity right. that died. Mm-hmm. I remember the whole plutonium-238 issue uh, with the Russians. That was discussed a, a bit. I think you discussed it at the NASA Advisory Council and uh, yeah. and some others did as well. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite a sensitive issue, but you know, ultimately, I, sure I, I, I said, how can you argue against this? We're taking plutonium out of nuclear weapons and putting them into science. Come on, guys. That's a good thing. <laughs> so you're an early proponent of STEM education and the importance of getting children excited about science, which we've kind of talked about earlier in the podcast. And when you first became associate administrator, you required all project proposals to set aside one to three percent of the budget for STEM education. And at IHMC, we we also believe in the importance of STEM. And our podcast is called STEM Talk, after all. (laughs) Um, I understand that you received a letter from a young Mexico City student in the early days of Hubble that made an impression on you. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, let me give you a little context. I mean, I that interest not only started with myself being you know inspired and all that uh, to get into science when I was thirteen years old, but when I became uh, head of Hubble, I knew Hubble was going to have tremendous scientific capability, but unlike a lot of other NASA missions, it was going to have incredible public appreciation and inspirational capability with kids. So I did something that would never was never done on a project before. The Space Telescope Science Institute was being formed, or was formed, and they had a public affairs and uh, education office, and they had a small budget. And I said, I'm going to take care of something now forever that needs to be taken care of and needs, needs to be protected. I basically set aside 3% of the overall Hubble budget for the public affairs and education office at the Institute whose job it was to get all of Hubble data, one, available to anybody on Earth who wanted it, either through, back in those days, hard copies, pictures, or ultimately the internet. Side note, people are shocked in my neighborhood when they ask me how they can buy Hubble pictures. I said, why would you buy it? Go on the internet, stsci.edu, and you can download any high-resolution picture of Hubble ever taken for absolutely free. And that's due to this office I've created. Anyway, so I set this in place back when the, even before Hubble was launched. And to this day, that office still gets a protected budget to protect the education, public outreach. And you say, why do you have to protect it? Well, uh, and Ken will appreciate this. Any good project manager who's usually an engineer or manager, uh, when they need money, one of the first places they look is public affairs or education. That's always a good source of money. And I protected that from Hubble. And that's part of the reason Hubble became so visible in, in, in the world, because it got its message out to the people that counted. After Hubble was successful, I decided maybe I ought to do this more more across the board, and I put in a policy. I, I don't know if it's still in place. I think uh, it is at the 1% level, but I said every project must set aside 1% to 3% of its budget from the very beginning of the project to the very end of the project to support public outreach and educational activities. And uh, this had never been done at NASA before, and uh, I think it's still still going on today. I think it is. And uh, now in Carolina. Okay. This was the, this is a heartwarming experience. I mean, I it was I, I think it was like about 1994 after Hubble started producing data that went all over the world. I got a letter, and somehow my secretary missed it because usually the secretary's job was to intercept public mail and, and take care of it. Luckily, they didn't intercept this letter. I got it on my desk as an associate administrator. I opened it up, and it was it was in very broken English, clearly handwritten. It came from Mexico City, and it was from this little 10 year old girl named Carolina. 
And she said, I've, I've been watching the pictures on uh, in my school, on the TV in my school, because she's a very poor neighborhood in Mexico City, by the way. The only TV she got was at school, one television for like 50 kids. And I'm very interested in, in science. I want to be a scientist. I think I want to be a scientist some, something, you know, on and on and on about how thrilled she was about science and the pictures from Hubble. And could I send her some more information? Now, usually these letters got dumped on public affairs at the NASA headquarters and they'd send out a picture of Jupiter or something like that. But this, this kind of got me. So I decided to take some time and uh, still it breaks me up when I think about it. <laughs> so I uh, set aside some time and I put together maybe about a one inch thick nine by 12 envelope with pictures, information, science written for, you know, a 10 year old type stuff. And uh, I, I sent it off to her. And uh, about six months later, I got, you know, a letter back, you know, from this kid who was absolutely thrilled to death. She even wrote a poem thanking me. The poem, it was about her inspiration, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. And it even got published in the NASA headquarters bulletin because it was so heartwarming. Long story short, we stayed in contact for years. She wound up going to high school. She wound up still contacting me. And I, I, I had a guy, uh, Orlando Figueroa, who was Spanish in my uh, organization. He was actually Mars program director. Anyway, he would occasionally translate something for me so I could send it to her in Spanish so she really, really understood it. I even wound up calling her up once, her neighbor's phone, talking to her. And, uh, you know, then there was a time that I, I have a, had a friend, Steve Strom, who was an astronomer up at the University of Mass. I talked to him and somehow this came up and he said, you know, we got a, we got a foreign exchange program here at Mass for high school students in poor countries like Mexico. Uh, you know, I'd be willing to interview this person, see if she'd like to come up to UMass sometime for, uh, you know, one of our summer programs. Long story short, I told Carolina about this. She found an aunt or a cousin in, in Maryland who would put her up. So she somehow got the money to come up to Maryland. While she was in Maryland, I arranged a tour of Goddard for her and got her dressed up in a bunny suit, uh, a clean room suit, and got her to take her into the huge clean room where we had the Hubble mock-up, where we practiced at servicing missions. So here was this little 10-year-old girl from, well, then she was about 16, from Mexico City, who was going into a clean room of a billion dollar project. Uh, you know, she was just awestruck. And then she, then Massachusetts flew her up to Massachusetts for an interview. Uh, that, that never worked out because of money. I guess she couldn't afford to go up there for a summer and they, they didn't give her enough money. But anyway, she got, got, a, got a trip of her lifetime. Uh, and then the end of the story, I can go on for hours, but the end of the story is she wound up going to uh, an engineering school. She wound up becoming a mechanical engineer, getting a good job in some firm, and she's living happily now in Mexico City. That's really mm -hmm. cool. That's such a great story. So, Ed, we discussed exoplanets earlier in this interview, and we also discussed in exoplanets and the possibility of life in our Milky Way and beyond in episode number 33 with Dr. Natalie Battaglia, who's from NASA Ames. And when you give public lectures, you often tell people that in another 20 to 50 years, we will live in a time when we can prove the existence of other life in the universe. So can you talk about why you're so confident in that? Well, actually, it's when I, when I investigate why I have such an interest in exoplanets and extraterrestrial life, it actually goes back to what I said earlier about that J. Allen Hynek lecture back when I was like 12 or 11 at Northwestern, chairman of the uh, Blue Project Blue Book. He talked a little bit about exoplanets and life in the universe. It must have planted a seed in my mind because it became such a major driving force later in life. And you got to remember the context. When I, when I went to college and grad school, if you talked about other planets than other solar systems, other astronomers would kind of look at you like you're out of your mind. And that's kind of why J. Allen Hynek was never, was kind of uh, thrown, <laughs> thrown out of the astronomical world because of his, uh, you know, interest in this field. And it's understandable why. I mean, we only had one solar system. I mean, it was ours, right? And we're special. And J. Allen Hynek used to talk about this as the cosmic decentralization of humans. Uh, in those days, it was man. I, I use humans. Uh, what do I mean by that? You know, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, we were the center of the universe. In fact, in the Greek days, you looked up at the sun. And clearly, the sun went around us, the moon went around us, the stars went around us, everything went around the earth. Therefore, we were the center of the universe. We were superior. Then this guy Copernicus comes along and screws it all up by, uh, you know, or Galileo. First, it was Galileo. He looked at Jupiter one night, which I did, by the way, the other night with my telescope and saw the Galilean moons. Uh, anyway, he looked at Jupiter and saw these things going around it. And he took that 
took that observation to the clerics of the day and said, hey, how could things always move around the earth if these things are moving around you, this, this thing called Jupiter? And of course, he almost got hung for that. Long story short, Copernicus came along and basically decided that the earth was not the center of the universe, that perhaps the sun was, and everything moved around the sun. That worked pretty well for a while. And then it turned out we discovered that the sun wasn't the center. So what did we do? We put the sun at the center of the galaxy. That didn't work out too well. Well, we live in the only galaxy and the biggest galaxy. That didn't work out too well as more and more galaxies were discovered with Hubble and other people. And uh, the bottom line is we get, kept getting pushed back and back and back. So over the course of thousands of years, we went from the center of the universe to uh, like a, a, lo a lonely a lonely solar system in, in the suburbs, <laughs> you know, and uh, this was very disconcerting. So here we are, the only, at least, at least we can hold on to something, right? We are the only solar system in the universe. And this was, this was the way it was in the 60s and 70s when I went to school. Then things started changing again. Suddenly, a few planets were discovered, and then a few more. And again, to make a long story short, we've gone from our, us being the only solar system in the universe to uh, just about every star seems to have planets in the universe. Talk about cosmic decentralization of humans. But we got something left to hold on to. We obviously are the only life in the universe, right? Well, let's talk about that. It turns out, my wife's a biologist, so she can back me up on this. Wherever you look on the earth, if there's organic material, and by the way, when I use the term organic, I'm using it correctly. Not, it's not material that isn't, uh, doesn't have pesticides uh, in it. Oh, yeah, it's you just, organic material. Uh, <laughs> it has carbon in it. You just hit one of my pet peeves. <laughs> oh, that's my number one pet uh -huh. peeve. That I, and new normal. Misuse of uh -huh. organic. Anyway, if you've got organic material, which has carbon in it, if you've got H2O, water, and you've got energy, if you've got those three ingredients on Earth, you can look anywhere on Earth, whether it's in Yellowstone at the bottom of a sulfur boiling pool, whether it's in Antarctic glaciers, Antarctic lakes, whether it's uh, 10,000 feet below the surface of uh, the Pacific, which is pretty dark, but they've got energy coming out of volcanic vents, heat, they've got organic material, and they've got lots of water. And they've got these things called tube worms, four foot long worms that are just happy go lucky at 10,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. Not exactly your uh, uh, you know, perfect environment. So the bottom line is the Goldilocks theory of life, which is what I like to call it, what it used to be. That is, if, you have, if it's 72 sunny and you've got lots of clean air to breathe, you've got life. That ain't true. Uh, life exists in many, many places. Well, but of course, there's, there's none of these places uh, in the universe, right? There's no organic material out there. There's no water. There's no... Uh, well, sorry, there's water every place we look in interstellar clouds to below the surface of Mars. There's organic material all over Mars, as Perseverance has shown us, and uh, Curiosity. And there's plenty of energy, plenty of energy in the universe. So why should we think that life is so difficult to find? And then we go to, are there places for it to exist? Well, all right, the Hubble Deep Field showed us there were 5,000 galaxies in an area one two hundred millionth of the uh, sky. If you do the math, uh, that comes out to be uh, you know, a lot of galaxies. If you do the math with 10 to the 11 stars in uh, all the galaxies, work it out, you get to be about 10 to the 23rd stars, like our sun, in the universe. 10 to the 23rd. For listeners who aren't good with scientific notation, that's one followed by 23 zeros stars. Ah, but how many stars have planets? Well, now we know the number is not zero. It's probably almost every star, but let's be very conservative. Let's be conservative. Let's say that only one in 10 stars has planets. All right. Well, let's, that reduces the uh, number to one followed by 22 zeros. Okay. But planets, you know, planets could be like Saturn or Jupiter, gas giants. You know, if they have a solar system, what are the odds that there's an Earth in that solar system? Well, let's be really, really super conservative and say only one in a hundred solar systems has a planet like Earth. So the bad news is we no lose another two zeros and we're down to one followed by 20 zeros. Hmm. Okay. Just because it's Earth doesn't mean it has, uh, you know, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen and all the good stuff you need. So let's say that only one in a hundred of those Earth-like planets has the stuff you need for life. That gets you down to one followed by 18 zeros. Okay, well, just having life, it could be grass, it could be, uh, you know, bugs, you know, what about intelligent life? Well, let's get conservative again. Let's say only one in a thousand of those Earth-like planets has intelligent life. Another three zeros go away. Now we're down to a measly one followed by 15. 
13 zeros. How arrogant can humans be and have been for all these decades and centuries and millennia to think we're the only life in the universe when even with my conservative analysis, I can say there are probably one followed by 15 zeros, Earths with life. That's why I say that within 20 or 30 years, our grandchildren will live in a world, if, if we don't blow ourselves up or if the democracy doesn't end or whatever, if technology keeps progressing, we will, they will live to observe for the first time in human history, humans being able to say we are not alone. Uh, and I am thoroughly and totally convinced about, of that. So following up on that, um, not exactly following up, but in the sort of uh, same theme, I assume that you've seen the Pentagon report regarding the number of unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs. Uh, you're not supposed to call them UFOs anymore in the Department <laughs> yeah. of Defense. We discussed this report in episode 127 of STEM Talk. But to cut to the chase, the study does not actually suggest that aliens are responsible for the 144 sightings of UAPs by military pilots between 2004 and 2021. But interestingly, the report does clearly state most of the UAP reported probably do represent physical objects, given that a majority of the UAP were registered across multiple sensors to include radar, infrared, electro-optical, weapon seekers, and visual observation. So if these are indeed physical objects, what are they? Do you have any thoughts on this? I would, you know, I would love to think and believe that they're Klingons or, uh, you know, better yet, people like Spock yeah. uh, observing <clears throat> us. Spock would be I mean, preferable. I, I, yes, the Klingons, no. Well, in, in the later stages of Star Trek, they were okay. Well, one but Klingon. definitely not the Borg. <laughs> definitely not the Borg. Uh, as you can see, I'm a Star Trek aficionado. I would love to believe that that's what they are. I think it's perhaps more important and, and certainly important for this report that finally, finally, they recognize there's something going on and we don't know how to explain it. I mean, that's what J. Allen Hynek fought mm -hmm. all his career. Right. He, he had the same concept. He said, there's something there, but you guys just won't accept it. He did not say they were UFOs. He did not, I mean, he did not say they were extraterrestrial. He just said, you can't blame it all on swamp gas. I remember that was one of the favorite ones. Uh, but uh, so this Air Force report should be applauded for that. There is something going on. Are there physical phenomena that could produce these things that we are unaware of? I got to believe there are. We have, we have a history as humans is always thinking we're smarter than the universe. I mean, as, 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 and as Hubble and other telescopes have shown us with early galaxies, the universe and, and physics follows its own textbooks, not us human, our human textbooks. So could there be physical phenomena that we purely don't understand? We probably don't want to admit that. It's embarrassing to admit it. But could it be? Yes. Or do we have to conclude that it's extraterrestrials? I tend to think sociologically or psychologically about extraterrestrials. And, and I go back to the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still, which is one of the first science fiction movies, which I think had a really important philosophical message. If uh, tomorrow a uh, starship landed on the White House lawn, what would be the reaction? You know, would it be very different than it was in the 50s? <laughs> would we would we surround it with tanks? Would the Russians threaten war if we don't share the, you know, I, I mean, it would be a, it would be a hu humongous disruption on society, not to mention theology. What, what some religions would fall apart if suddenly there were other, you know, life forms. So you got to believe that if a society like the Vulcans have been studying us for a long time, they've got to recognize that we are a very, very delicate society in terms of our beliefs and, and what could happen. And we tend to shoot first and ask questions later. And uh, you don't want to do that with nuclear weapons, of course, as we learned with in the movie uh, Alien or whatever. <laughs> so would a society that's capable of star travel, of traveling between the stars, and by the way, that would, uh, again, that's something we don't know how to do. Our physics, our textbooks say it's impossible. So let's say that a society is so smart, so advanced, that they could violate all our laws of physics and get here. Wouldn't they be pretty smart psychologically and sociologically, first of all, to survive that long as a society, and not recognize the tremendous bad things that could happen if they reveal themselves to us too quickly? And, uh, you know, would they be stupid enough to be caught on radar? <laughs> would they be s stupid enough? <laughs> I mean, you got to make these very smart aliens really stupid to get caught. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. Assuming now, they care. 
Uh, exactly. Now, that Ken, that's an excellent point. I'm assuming human nature, and I'm assuming altruism, right. and I'm su- assuming intelligent. If they're like the, uh, what was that movie where a bunch of giant ants and uh, it was just Will Will Smith was in the movie? Uh, was Men that in, Alien? That wasn't Men Alien. In Black. Was, Men in Black. No, no, no. It was a huge, a huge ship that would sit over uh, the White House and blow it up, and oh. Yeah, I know and right. they finally they finally destroyed them by uh, flying into their spaceship and planting a nuclear missile in it and mm-hmm. blowing it up. It was it was a big movie. It was Sounds a huge horrible. movie about yeah. ten years ago. Independence Day. Independence That's Day. Right. There you go. Yeah, Independence. Day. You know, you're you're right, Ken. If if the aliens are like the Independence Day aliens, then if they're here to eat all our vegetation, you're absolutely right. <laughs> They've come a long way, and they're hungry. That uh, yeah. that that Pentagon report is remarkable in that it for the first time, clearly say these are physical objects. You know, it's not swamp gas. We, and uh, yeah, they say, uh, I forget what percentage, display physical properties, including motion that we're not able to explain and is beyond our technology. Yeah, and you can't make right turns at uh, Mach 6. Yeah. It's, 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 an, it's a really interesting report in that it's been criticized for sort of too carefully walking the line, but I think it's appropriate, right? We don't know what these what this is, and they don't claim it's extraterrestrials of any kind. They just say, we don't know what it is, yeah. it's real, and a uh, certain percentage of them have displayed behaviors that we can't explain. You know, another possibility, and again, maybe we're putting, making this too anthropomorphic, which I've been guilty of, <laughs> but people have been anthropomorphic in a lot of these areas. When we go to Mars, we don't, we don't send humans yet because we don't have the technology. But we flood these planets with all kinds of robotic spacecraft and orbiters and all that. Could these be extraterrestrials, but not the extraterrestrials themselves, but their probes, if you get my drift? Interesting. So, Ed, this has been a lot of fun, and you've certainly had an eventful and and very successful NASA career. And I've heard people refer to you as one of the most popular scientists at NASA that they've ever met, and that you had a real talent, as we've heard through this podcast, for building teams and camaraderie. And I also understand that when you were in Annapolis, uh, you were referred to as a guy with the boat who taught half of your staff how to water ski. So is that how you went about building camaraderie and teams? Well, that was certainly certainly uh, one of my passions. Of course, now at uh, at my age, my arthritis is killing me, and I'm, I'm paying the price of water skiing for 40 years and being a baseball player in high school and college and all that. Uh, if they only told me back then not to be so active. Uh, anyway, <laughs> that's another lesson for kids. Don't overdo it. Uh, anyway, I... Uh, I went to Florida, actually, on a spring break uh, one year, and my girlfriend and I went to uh, water ski school, Lyle Lee's Water Ski School in Fort Lauderdale. I still remember the name, but I can't remember where I put my keys five minutes ago. (laughs) Uh, This is 50 years ago. Uh, Anyway, we learned how to water ski, and then I came back to Chicago at the time. I was at Northwestern at the time, and I uh, was working, worked my way through college, and I saved up enough money to buy a little cheap uh, 15-foot speedboat, and I continued to develop my water skiing skills on Lake Michigan. And let me tell you, if you know anything about Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Superior is probably the same thing. If you, could, if you can water ski on Lake Michigan, you can water ski any place on earth <laughs> <laughs> for two reasons. One, the water's never higher than 70 degrees. And two, the waves are always very big. So uh, when I moved to uh, Annapolis, I bought a better boat and kept getting better and better boats. And I moved to Annapolis, had the boat in a hotel, so I had easy access to it. And I just, uh, you know, had a lot of fun water skiing and I wanted to share it. So uh, a lot of people at work, uh, obviously, didn't at NASA didn't have boats. So uh, every weekend I'd take a group out water skiing. And over the course of a summer, I'd probably uh, get 15, 20, 25 different people out. And uh, it was it was great camaraderie, and I don't think I looked at it as team building. I just thought looked at it as a social activity that I happened to enjoy, and other people seem to enjoy too. And some of my best friends turned out to be, and they're still my friends today, uh, water skiers. Well, that's a great uh, pastime, but also it's a great way to bring people together. So it's cool that you did that for for your staff and the people that you worked with. Yeah, well, I was told I was a pretty good teacher. I uh, you know they're. I remember remember the one thing I always taught them. I said, do exactly the opposite of what your body is telling you <laughs> when the boat starts to move. The, 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 your, the, your body's going to tell you, pull the rope and stand up. Yep. Don't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the 150 horses in the engine have a lot more power to do that for you. Yeah. Let the boat do it for you. <laughs> exactly. Well, Ed, it's been awesome talking to you today. Thank you so much for joining us on STEM Talk. 
It was a pleasure. The time just flew by. Thank you, Ed. It it was wonderful, and it was uh, good to hear your voice again after all these years. (laughs) It's been a while. It has been. (laughs) STEM talk. 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 So, Ken, it does really seem as if Ed was the man behind the curtain with respect to so many NASA missions and initiatives, and he had quite an impact during his 33 years at NASA. A really impressive career. Yes, he did indeed have a big impact. I interacted with Ed in the late 90s, and then again from 2008 to 2011 while I was the NASA Advisory Council Chairman. Ed was certainly an effective advocate for space science missions, and he provided strong leadership on their behalf. Definitely sounds like it. And if you enjoyed this interview as much as Ken and I did, we invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes at stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornegas signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.